have a story to tell because of what you've done for us. That our story is now hopeful. It is not one of despair and condemnation, but in Christ, in you, you are not done with us. We are no longer dead in sin, but we have overcome the grave because you, Jesus, have risen. Jesus, we praise you for that, and we ask that you would be present and that you would be sanctifying us and that you would bless the preaching of your word and that you would be glorified today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, you guys can take a seat. Uh, great singing tonight. My name is Josh. I'm one of the pastors here. If you're a guest, I'm really glad that you joined us and you picked a great Sunday to join us because we are going to commission parents and dedicate children today, which is by far the cutest Sunday of the year. Okay. And so you guys picked an incredible day uh, to be here. We have a lot of kids at our church, which I praise God for. We have about 50 kids that are connected to our kids ministry. Yeah. Let's just clap for the kids. That's right. Um, Man, we are passionate about coming alongside parents and helping them pass their faith on to the next generation. And one of the reasons for that is that study after study has shown that the number one influence in a child's life spiritually is their parents. It just absolutely is. So if you have a child, by default, you are the most influential person in their life. You are the primary disciple maker in your child's life. And so we commission parents to charge them with that, to say, hey, man, you are the only mom and dad that your kids are ever going to get. And you, every single day, can make the gospel clearer, more compelling, and more believable to your children by how you live. And you can do it in simple ways. You can do it by reading your Bible in the morning. So that your, your kid comes downstairs and it's just like, it is normal for my mom or my dad to have the scriptures open before they've done anything else. You can do it by repenting to your children and by teaching your children to say, I'm sorry, not I'm sorry, but, but straight up, I'm sorry, right? You can, you can teach it to your children by being involved in the local church, by serving, by giving, by inviting, by modeling for them what it looks like for Christ to be at the center of a life. And if you do that, if you live a transparent, faith-filled life, you make it so much easier for your kids to grow up to follow Christ. What an incredible privilege and what a weighty responsibility. So that's why we commission parents here. But we also do child dedication. And they're a little bit different. Child dedication is more uh, corporate in nature. See, child dedication is when these parents bring their sweet ones to the Lord and say, we are dedicating this child to you. We are praying that this child will one day personally decide to repent and follow you with the help of the church. So we're doing it in front of the church, almost like wedding vows, where witnesses come and say, we will help you keep these vows. We will help you raise this child in the Lord. Um, as Americans, we often uh, underestimate the power of the congregation in shaping a life. But here's a fascinating study that I saw. Uh, the difference between a child who grows up and walks with God in college versus a child who grows up and doesn't walk with God in college, the biggest difference is that kids who walk with God in college had one other adult outside of their families who is investing in them spiritually. Where do those adults come from? The local church. They come from the volunteer in the student, student ministry. They come from the young professional who takes your teenager out to coffee. They come from the college student who does a Bible study with your middle schooler. You see, when the church comes together and says, we will labor together to raise these children in the Lord, God does some pretty amazing things, okay? So this is a big deal. It's, it's an important deal. We love you guys. We want to come alongside you. So what I'm going to ask you to do is publicly commit to raise this child in the Lord. And I'm going to read you the commitments that I read to you last night, so I'm not just springing this on them, right? Uh, and then with conviction, and energy, your uh, response at the end will be, with God's help, we will, okay? So here is what I'm asking you to, to commit. In fact, I need to introduce you to these wonderful families, okay? Uh, so, so this is the Spence family, Ryan and Sarah Spence with their precious son, Declan. And then right over here, we have the Johnsons, Rick and Mallory Johnson with their precious son, Judah. We've been commissioning families all day. Uh, and so we did some in the four o'clock service and I, and I can't wait to do it uh, here in the 530. All right, here we go. Parents, if you'll face me, with God's help, will you commit to teach your children God's word? Will you seek the Lord personally and model gospel change in your home? Will you raise your children in the training and instruction of the Lord? Will you discipline your children and show them grace? Will you pray for your children and teach them to pray? Will you prioritize the local church and lead your children to do the same? If so, please say, with God's help, we will. You guys did awesome. All right. Now, face the congregation. Congregation, you have a job in this, okay? You didn't know you had a job when you come in here. Well, you got a job now, okay? And so I'm going to ask you to make a similar commitment, and at the end, with conviction and energy, I want you to say the same thing. With God's help, we will. Church, will you commit to seek the Lord personally and model gospel change in your life? Will you pray for these children that they grow to love and trust in Christ? Will you teach them the gospel through your words and through your example? 
And will you pray for these parents and encourage them as they face the trials of parenting? If so, please say, with God's help, we will. You guys are amazing. All right, so here's what I'm going to ask you to do next. If you would extend a hand out, this is just symbolizing that we as a congregation are praying over these families. And I'm just going to pray God's blessing over these families. Father, we thank you for these precious children. And we know that children are a heritage from you, Lord, the fruit of the, the womb of reward. And so we pray for the salvation of these sweet boys. We pray that they grow up to be mighty in the land. We pray for every child in our church that they would grow to walk with you that the kids in our church would never know a day that they didn't believe the, the, the good news of the gospel, trust the scriptures, and have adults in their life who are modeling faithfulness for them. So God, help us to be a church that invests in the next generation and sees many men and women grow up to love and to follow you all the days of, your, of their life. God, we love you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, can we give a big hand to these parents? All right, well, if you have a Bible, you can take it out. You can type to or turn to Exodus chapter 15. Exodus chapter 15. If you've been with us, you know we've been walking chapter by chapter through the book of Exodus, and now we come to uh, chapter 15. Um, something that, that I just told you is we have a lot of kids. Something else that you should know about us is that we sing a lot, okay? We sing a lot here, and you probably knew that, right? You've been here for half the service. We've spent most of the service singing so far. Um, I'm not going to sing, don't worry, but uh, we've been singing a lot, and most people know that singing is part of what churches do, um, we call it worship, okay? And worship is a core part of who ch churches are and what churches do. Not only is worship and singing part of what churches do, worship and singing is also part of what churches fight about, okay? Church, churches fight about singing. They all do, right? If you ask the question, what is the primary cause of churches dividing and splitting, the answer would be worship wars, okay? The answer would be, what should we sing, Okay, what songs should we sing? What instruments should we use? Should there be drums or no drums? Should it be an organ or no organ? How loud should the music be? How soft should the music be? Right, should we be expressive or should we be contemplative? I heard some churches sing secular songs. Is that okay? Like, we just have all these questions that go on and on and on, and you would not believe how many churches divide and split and break up over worship. So the question is, does the Bible have anything to say about how we worship, about how we come together to sing? If it's such a big deal of what we do every single Sunday, do we have any guidance from the scriptures? And the answer is we do. We have a lot of guidance from the scriptures, and a lot of it comes from Exodus chapter 15. Because Exodus chapter 15 is the very first song in the Bible. It's the very first worship song in the Bible, probably in history. And as you look at the rest of the songs in the Bible, what you find is that all the other songs in the scriptures follow the pattern of Exodus 15. So in that sense, it's not only the first, but it's also a modern, a paradigm, a pattern for how we're supposed to worship. So by understanding Exodus 15 and what it teaches us about worship, it actually helps us understand how we should worship today. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to walk through Exodus 15, this, what's often called the Song of Moses, and I'm going to draw out four principles of worship that were true then and that are true for us today. All right, look at verse 1 with me. It says this, Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord. So the word then establishes this chronologically. Then, it happened after what? Well, it happened after chapters 1 through 14 of Exodus, right? So the, the people of God were enslaved in Egypt for 400 years, and then God raised up Moses as a deliverer. And with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, God miraculously delivered his people out of slavery, through the Red Sea, and into freedom. So just before chapter 15, God had magnificently and miraculously saved his people and destroyed their enemies. That is what just happened. Deliverance just occurred. And what I love is that the very first thing that they do is they sing. The very first thing that the Israelites do once they've been saved from their enemies is they burst out into song. And you'll notice that the text says Moses and the people sang the song. It doesn't say Moses sang the song and the people stood around and looked bored. It doesn't say Moses sang the song and the people came in late, had their hands in their pockets and drank a cup of coffee, right? And yet that's the experience of a lot of worship leaders in churches today. It's like, I guess I'm the one singing and everyone else looks bored or tired and that girl's on her phone, right? Like that, that's the experience, but that's not what we see here. Moses and the people are singing. Now scroll down or, or look down to verse 20 with me. It says this, then Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a tambourine in her hand, and all the women went out after her with tambourines and dancing. So Miriam was Moses' older sister, and at the end of this song, Miriam leads in like an additional bridge. You know, the worship leader gets led by the Spirit and sings more. That's what happens, right? So Miriam grabs a tambourine. She runs out in front of everyone, and all the women follow her singing and dancing with these tambourines. So it's Moses and the people. It's Miriam and all of the women, which lead to the first principle of worship for us today. Number one, all of us should sing. All of us should sing. I mean, very simple tonight, okay? All of us should sing. In verses 
1 and verse 20, you see a dynamic relationship between the leaders and the congregation in worship. Okay, the leaders have a responsibility to initiate, to lead. You see Moses and Miriam both doing that. And that's still true today. The worship culture of a church will never exceed the worship culture of its leaders. Right? The worship culture of a church will never be higher than the worship culture of its leaders. It reminds me of uh, Pastor John Piper. I don't know if you guys know who John Piper is. He was a pastor for many, many years in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And this is um, a picture of Pastor John that we've got here. So, uh, you know, pretty buttoned up guy, right? Like, you know, he's got the blazer. I'm trying to look like John today. That's what I'm doing. So, you know, he's got the blazer on and, you know, he's kind of an older guy. Not what you would think of when you think of a worship leader, right? Like, that's, that's not what you would think of. Okay, but here's a picture of Pastor John worshiping. Boom, baby. All right? That is what's called the Piper Pump. That is what that's called. We're raising the roof for Jesus is what we're doing. Right? Here's what I love about John Piper. Every single Sunday, he was front row at his church glorifying the Lord expressively. Right? What was he doing? He was setting the temperature of worship at his church. You see, if you're a leader in our church, you have a responsibility to set the culture of worship here. This certainly applies to me and Pastor Justin, our elder team, but man, it applies to anyone that has any role of leadership. So if you're an MC leader, if you're a DNA group leader, if you're a volunteer leader, if you're a member here, you have a responsibility to set the worship culture. And the reason is, every time someone comes in here, this is the question they're asking. What kind of church is this? What kind of church is this? If you're new here, that's what you've been asking for the last 20 minutes. What kind of church is this? Is this a raise your hands church? Right? Is this a shouts of praise church? Is this a get a tambourine out of your purse church? Come on. Come on. I don't know who's got one. Get it out. Okay? Or is this like a hands in your pockets, drink your cup of coffee, come in late, look bored church? Right? I mean, the answer to that depends entirely on the members of our church. And so what I want us to do is I want us to create a culture that honors the Lord in worship. Just like Moses and Miriam let out, set the pace, that's what we are called to do as leaders. But it wasn't just Moses and Miriam, it was also the people, and it's not supposed to just be leaders, people with official roles of leadership in our church, but it's also supposed to be all the people. Why? Because everyone who has been saved by the Lord is called to worship the Lord. Everyone who has been saved by the Lord is called to worship the Lord. So if you are here tonight, and you've been saved by the work of Christ, then the scriptures would call you to worship Christ for what he has done in your life. And that's what happens in verses 1 and 2. Look at this. I will sing to the Lord. For he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. Do you notice how many possessive pronouns there are in those verses? I will sing. My strength, my song, my salvation, my God. I will praise him. I will exalt him. You see, this song was sung by the entire congregation, but each person made it their own. It was sung by the entire congregation, but each person made it their own. You see, every believer is called to take personal ownership of every worship song. Every believer is called to take personal ownership of every worship song. Like, that is my testimony that I just sang. It's true of all of us, but it's also true of me. You see this all throughout the scriptures, all throughout the Psalms. You see the worship leader calling the congregation to worship. You also see it in Colossians chapter 3. Paul is addressing the Colossian church, and this is what he says. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your heart to God. You see that word you richly? That's plural. That's y'all. That's all y'all. That's what that means. This is what Paul is saying. All y'all need to be singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. All y'all need to be doing it. Not just one of you, not just the one with a good voice, not just the one who can play the piano, but all of you need to be singing these songs. In fact, there are 50 distinct commands throughout the Bible to sing. 50 distinct commands to sing, to respond to what God has done in your life through singing. The whole idea is that we are called to worship together, that we are called to sing corporately. Now, what's interesting is that um, corporate singing was one of the first things that experts kind of during the pandemic said, hey, like for a season, like let's not do that because it, it, it spreads a lot of germs. And so um, the Atlantic, which is not a Christian newspaper, uh, the Atlantic uh, wanted to study this and they, and they wanted to see, okay, what are we missing by not singing corporately? What are the benefits of singing corporately? And this is what they found uh, in an article that, that I read. When you sing with other people, it's a natural antidepressant. When you sing with other people, it actually releases chemicals in your brain that are an antidepressant. Um, here's another one. It immediately improves your immune system. That fascinating? I don't know how you understand. Like, isn't that fascinating? It immediately improves your immune system. And, and here's the final one. When you sing with other people, it releases a hormone that helps you bond with people socially. Isn't that fascinating? 
don't you love it when science catches up with the Bible, right? Like, um, right, but here, I mean, God has been saying this for, for thousands of years, sing together. When you sing together, man, it helps you bond with one another. We are called to sing. Here's what all of this means. If I could summarize point one, it's this. Every saved person should sing every song every Sunday, okay? Just to be real clear, every saved person should sing every song every Sunday. So if you're a saved person, if you're here on Sunday, you should sing every song, okay? That is what the scriptures are teaching, And if we follow the pattern of Exodus 15, where both leaders and congregation are singing, it helps us avoid the error of what I would call the spectator service. Okay, what is a spectator service? Spectator service is when you show up to watch other people worship. And there's a formal version of this, right? When you show up and to watch the priest, you know, burn incense and ring bells and and do all that. There's a contemporary version of this. When you show up to watch the massively gifted worship band sing, and like, you're not singing, but you're just like, man, they're great. What is that? That is a spectator service. That is not biblical. That is a sub-biblical expression of worship. We're not called to show up to spectate. We're called to worship and to engage and to give God glory. If you've been saved by Christ, you are called to worship Christ. Every saved person should sing every song every Sunday. Now, the truth is I know that many people don't sing on Sundays, right? I know, I know it's true. And I don't, you know, maybe you don't sing on Sundays. I don't know why, if that's the case. Maybe um, it just makes you feel weird. You know, and you're like, I don't sing with other people anywhere else, and I'm not doing it here, right? So, like, maybe that's you. Uh, maybe you're, like, insecure about your voice. You're like, I'm going to, like, sing off pitch. Look, I have no issue singing off pitch, okay? So, uh, you know, I'm setting the culture here, guys. You don't have to sing on pitch, right? Maybe, maybe you're insecure about singing. I, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe you have some other reason um, for, not, for not singing. I don't know what it is. But when we don't sing on Sundays for those reasons, it betrays that we don't understand why we sing theologically. You see, you don't sing because your voice is good or because the song is good. You sing because your God is good. You, know you don't sing because you're good at it or the song's good at it. You sing because of who God is and what he's done in your life. And just so you know, Revelation 5 tells us that when we get to heaven, here's what's going to be happening. Everyone who's ever been saved by the work of Christ is going to be encircling the throne of God singing. Right? So if you don't like singing, you have got a long road ahead of you. Okay? Like... Like, you might as well get used to it now and start singing because that is where we are headed. Um, hey, the, the good news is a lot of you do sing. One of the things I'm most proud of of our church is that we have so many of you that do sing, and you sing passionately, and you sing expressively. I've actually talked to people who have joined our church because of your singing. Isn't that amazing? And I've said, hey, why, why have you come to Center Church? And they just say, man, you all worship the living God here. Like, like you're, you actually believe this. You're actually worship the living God. I can tell, and that, that was just compelling to me, and I wanted to be a part of it. You see, the way a church worships can be evangelistic. That's what Paul says as much in 1 Corinthians 14. He says, look, when you worship with passion and biblical expressiveness, it causes outsiders to look around and say, God is really among these people. To say, God is really among these people. All right, so point number one, all of us should sing. Every saved person should sing every song every Sunday. All right, verse three. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his host he cast into the sea, and his chosen officers were sunk in the Red Sea. The floods covered them. They went down into the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you overthrow your adversaries. You send out your fury. It consumes them like stubble. At the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. The floods stood up in a heap. The deeps congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue. I will overtake. I will divide the spoil. My desire shall have its fill of them. I will draw my sword. My hand shall destroy them. But you blew with your wind. The sea covered them. They sank like lead into the mighty waters. In verse 3, the song begins to focus on the character of God. And in verse 3, we have the very first attribute of God that is ever sung about in a worship song. And it is not what you would expect. It is not God is love. It is God is a man of war. I mean, this is the first worship song in the Bible. The first attribute that we're singing about is God is a man of war. His right hand is glorious with power. He throws his enemies into the sea. He's a man of war. Now, if you did an anecdotal study, here's what you would find. Not everyone sings in church but women sing a lot more in church than men do. It's just true. I don't have data for you, but just, I mean, it's, it's not hard to figure out. You can just listen, and it's like the pitch is very high right now, right? Not a whole lot of baritone going, like, bring it down, you know? Why is that? I, I mean, I don't know. There's probably a lot of reasons why that is, but I think one of the reasons is that, man, men don't want to sing romantic love songs to Jesus, right? I know you know what I'm talking about. It's just weird. It, like, it, just, it doesn't kind of match up with the nature of who God has made us. You see, oftentimes guys really start to grow in their faith 
when they make this connection, that God is love, but he's also a man of war. God is love, but he's also a man of war. That Jesus is the lamb who was slain, he's also the line of the tribe of Judah, who comes to conquer his enemies and set up his throne upon the earth. You cannot read the New Testament honestly without concluding that Jesus was a man of war. I mean, think about how he interacted with the demonic. I mean, he absolutely showed terrifying authority. Think about how he interacted with the arrogant religious establishment. He was fierce. He was a man of war. He was very tender with the broken. He was very, very tough with the arrogant. There is no way that you can read the Bible and not conclude that God is a man of war. God is love, yes. God is also just. God is gentle and compassionate, yes. God is also a man of war who throws down his enemies. Here's what this means. God doesn't want men to become soft. He wants men to become holy. And there's a big difference. God doesn't want men to become soft. He wants men to become holy, and there's a big difference. To use their strength, their competitiveness, their ambition to serve their wives. To love their children and raise them in the Lord to help build the church. Look, the Lord is a man of war. God is love, yes. God is also a man of war who fights for his people. And we need to have a holistic, biblical understanding of the view of God. And I'm concerned that a lot of times our worship songs only focus on aspects of God's character that are really palatable in our culture. And what that does is it leaves a whole group of people in our congregation, usually men, who are like, I don't really feel like I can connect with that because we're only singing about one aspect of who God is. We need to have a biblical, holistic view of who God is. God is love. God is also a man of war. And what I hope you see in these verses is how radically God-centered they are. I mean, in eight verses, we have 11 references to God. If you zoom out to the, to the whole chapter, in 21 verses, you have 50 references to God, which leads to the second principle of worship. We should sing to God and about God. We should sing to God and about God. If you asked, who is this song about? I mean, the obvious answer would be God. There are implications in it for the Israelites. They're mentioned every once in a while, but the song is not about the Israelites. The song is radically god centered. And it's also not just about God, it's also to him. In verse 1, it says Moses and the people sang to the Lord. In verse 20, it says, 21, it says that Miriam and all the women sang to the Lord. Now, why is that? Because when you sing to someone publicly, when you dedicate a song to them, it honors them in a very unique way. It makes me think about um, a Christmas party I was at at my last church. So it's a pretty large church. There are like 300 people at this Christmas party, and we're sitting there eating dinner. And at one point, the, the worship leader goes up on stage and starts like playing the piano. And, you know, we were all like, oh, he's a worship leader. He's just doing his worship leader thing, right? Um, and so, like, we're eating, and he's playing the song, and he's singing it we haven't ever heard before. And, um, and at some point, I'm, like, sitting there. You ever had this moment when you're listening to, like, Reliant K or something where you're like, is this song about Jesus or a girl? I can't really tell. You know, you know what I'm talking about? You're like, I can't. But until verse 3, you're not sure. Um, well, that, I'm, like, kind of, like, picking up these vibes. And then there's, like, a moment that it dawned on all 300 of us at the same time that this song is about a girl. This song is about a specific girl, sure enough. Verse 4, gets up from the keys in front of 300 people, walks down on the floor, proposes to his girlfriend. The song was to the girlfriend, right? And I know for some of you, I just described your worst nightmare. Like, uh, I was talking to the earlier service, Daniel Kennedy is married to Chris Kennedy, and I was like, if he would have done that, Daniel would have said no, and she was like, that's absolutely true. Like, I would not have accepted that proposal. Like, change is awful, right? But here's the thing. At the end of that song, everyone was paying attention to one person, that girl. That's what worship songs are supposed to do. Worship songs are supposed to take our eyes off of us and put our eyes on the Lord. Right? Because here's the thing. If you're anything like me, I don't need any help thinking about myself. Right? I spend most of my week thinking about my problems, my pains, my wants, my desires, my successes, my failures. What I need on Sunday is help to stop thinking about me and to start thinking about God. And to start thinking about his attributes and his character and his worthiness. That's what I need. I think that that is what you need. Unfortunately, so much of contemporary Christian music is me-centered. I mean, just go through the top 10 on Billboard and count the pronouns. It's, it's horrifying. It is the exact opposite of this. 50 references to God in 21 verses. I'm not sure there's 50 references to God in the entire top 10 catalog of Christian music right now. It's just radically me-centered. But what we need is God-centered worship that leads our eyes and our hearts away from ourselves into a higher, holier place where we see who God is, that's actually what's best for, your practi for you practically. When you remember there is a God who's bigger than your problems, bigger than your circumstances, bigger than what you've got going on, it elevates, man, your perspective and it changes how you interact with your world. So that's what we want to do here as a church. And that's why as a church, we always value substance over style. We always value substance over style. We're more concerned with singing the right things than singing them in a particular way. 
Look, we have an incredible worship team. I'm really grateful to the Lord for the worship team he's given us. Man, but there are popular worship songs that we do not sing because the substance is so questionable. Right? We try to be very theologically thoughtful in the songs we sing that glorify God, that help us ap- apply the things that he's done in our lives. Because when you come in here on Sunday, I don't want you to leave thinking about you. I want you to leave thinking about God and how incredible he is and how worthy he is and how now you get to go all week and you get to live your life for him. Now, why does this matter? Why, why am I like going on a rant about this? Because songs are portable theology. I mean, songs are sermons you actually remember, right? Like, you don't have to tell me. You don't remember anything I said last week. You're like, I think he talked for a longer time than usual, and he told a joke at one point. Like, that's, that's, that's all you got, right? But you probably remember some of the songs we sang last week. They, like, rattle around in your brain. You see, songs are portable theology. They're sermons that you remember. And so we need to make sure that we're singing songs that are to God and about God, that are shaping our worldview so that we're understanding who God is better when we're relating to him appropriately, okay? So that's the second principle. All right, look at verse 11 with me. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? You stretched out your right hand, and the earth swallowed them. You have led in your steadfast love the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them by your strength to your holy abode. The peoples have heard. They tremble. Pangs have seized the inhabitants of Philistia. Now are the chiefs of Edom dismayed. Trembling seizes the leaders of Moab. All the inhabitants of Canaan have melted away. Terror and dread fall upon them because of the greatness of your arm. They are still as a stone till your people, O Lord, pass by, till the people pass by whom you have purchased. You will bring them in and plant them on your own mountain, the place, O Lord, which you have made for your abode, the sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. The Lord will reign forever and ever. All right, what happens at this point in the song is you realize that it's progressive. You see, this song is a progressive story of God's faithfulness, his faithfulness in the past, his faithfulness in the present, and his faithfulness in the future. In verse 11, Moses asks this rhetorical question, who is like you among the gods? That is a reference to God's work in Egypt. You see, part of the plagues was to demonstrate that he alone is the one true God and that the pagans, pagan gods of Egypt were nothing, right? Who is like you among the gods? That's a reference to the past. Look at verse 12. You stretched out your hand and the earth swallowed them. That's in reference to how God judged the Egyptian forces in the Red Sea, past faithfulness. Verse 13 says this, you have led in your steadfast love the people you have redeemed, and you have guided them to your holy abode. That referred to the very present moment that Israel was in. They were still being guided by the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night, and they were being guided to God's holy mountain, Mount Sinai. So that's God's faithfulness in the present. Then it starts talking about the future. Verse 14 describes how rival nations whom Israel would encounter would melt away in fear because of the power of the Lord. Verse 17 describes how the Lord will bring his people into the promised land and establish them on his holy mountain and his sanctuary. That's a reference to the temple in Jerusalem. And then verse 18 looks to the eternal future when the Lord will reign forever and ever and every one of his enemies will be made his footstool. You see, Exodus 15 has a progressive structure. It talks about God's faithfulness in the past, his faithfulness right now in the present, and his faithfulness in the future. And we need to do the same thing as we sing. So number three, we should sing about God's faithfulness in the past, present, and future past, present, and future. I was talking to a friend of mine, and he, he made a comment that he, you know, he noticed that oftentimes hymns talk about God's faithfulness in the past. Contemporary worship songs talk about God's faithfulness in the present, and gospel songs talk about God's faithfulness in the future. And certainly there are exceptions to that, but I thought that was a really helpful observation. And we need all three. We need all three to help us worship the Lord. In fact, look at verse 2 of chapter 15. This is my God, and I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will extol him. What are they doing? They're looking back on God's faithfulness in the past. So we need to sing songs like when I survey the wondrous cross. We need to look back on what Christ has done for his people, how Christ has already suffered once for all the righteous for the unrighteous to bring us to God. We need to look to the past, to God's faithfulness years and years ago. It's also helpful to sing songs from the past because when you sing songs from the past, it reminds you that you are not the first person to face difficulties. (laughs) that we are not the first church to experience affliction, but that God's people have been pilgriming through this world for thousands of years and God has led them through it. And, and what's amazing is that because God never changes and people don't change that much, old songs are very relevant. All right, let me, let me read you some verses from the song, Be Thou My Vision, which is a, a hymn that we sing here. Riches I heed not, nor vain empty praise. Thou mine inheritance now in all ways. Thou and thou only first in my heart. High King of heaven, my treasure thou art. So this hymn is about, man, struggling with the temptation towards wealth. But the, the hymn writer is saying, no, I'm not going to pursue 
empty riches. I'm going to pursue the Lord. This, this hymn has themes of man, not seeking the, the, the praise of men. I'm not going to live my life for the approval of my coworkers and my boss and my classmates and my professors and, and whoever else. I'm going to live for the approval of Christ. This hymn talks about, man, I'm going to make the Lord first in my heart. He's not just going to be an accessory to my life. He's going to be central in who I am. He's going to be central in how I live my life. These are extremely relevant themes for us today, aren't they? When was this written? In the fourth century by an Irish pastor. That's 1,600 years ago. 1,600 years, man, God's people have been wrestling with some of the same themes. And when we sing old songs, we're reminded that we are not the first Christians, man, to live in a culture that is changing rapidly. We are not the first Christians to live in a divided society. We're not even the first Christians to live through a worldwide pandemic. The church has lived through four of those. (laughs) What happens is when we look back and we see God's faithfulness through all of the years, we're reminded that, man, he's a rock. He's not just the rock of this age, he's the rock of all ages. And because he is the rock of all ages, he can be your rock and my rock, he can be our rock today no matter what comes at us. So we need songs that look back to the past and see God's faithfulness in it, just like Moses looked back to the past and saw God's faithfulness in it. We also need songs that focus on God's uh, faithfulness in the present, right? Contemporary worship songs tend to be really good at this. I I think of the song, Yes, I Will. It's basically like a declaration that based on what God has done in my life, what is true, I'm going to live with faith right now no matter what comes. And we need that. We need to be encouraged and we need to be comforted and we need to be built up and we need to be empowered to go out into the world and to live as salt and light. So we need contemporary worship songs. They're good, okay? And I think we all kind of resonate with that. We're very present-minded people. But we also need songs that focus on the future. Songs that focus on what God will do one day when Christ returns. And gospel songs tend to be really, really powerful in this regard. The truth is churches in places that, uh, churches that are experiencing persecution or that are marginalized tend to sing a lot more about the future than churches that aren't. And the reason is that churches that are being persecuted for their faith recognize that our hope is not heaven on earth, but heaven one day. Our hope is not heaven on earth, it is heaven one day. A great example of this is the song, Swing Low, Sweet Chariot. It was a song written and sung by enslaved people. It was not sung by people who are experiencing health, wealth, and prosperity for being followers of Christ. And they knew their hope was not heaven on earth, but it was heaven one day, that one day the chariot would swing low and it would take them to their eternal abode. You see, the more that you suffer, the more that the church suffers, the more that we need to sing songs that fix our eyes on the future hope of the new city of Jerusalem. That our hope is not heaven on earth, but it is heaven one day. So we need to sing about the past, we need to sing about the present, and we need to sing about the future. Verse 19, for when the horses of Pharaoh with his chariots and his horsemen went into the sea, The Lord brought back the waters of the sea upon them, but the people of Israel walked on dry ground in the midst of the sea. So that's kind of a summary. Verse 20. Then Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a tambourine in her hand, and all the women went out after her with tambourines and dancing. So Moses was the youngest of three. Miriam was his older sister, and she takes a tambourine. I don't know if she like had it in her purse or just found it. She takes a tambourine, and she runs out and leads all of the people out in singing. And they're singing, and they're dancing, and they're shaking their tambourines, okay? Now, I don't have time to do a whole sermon about why you should be expressive in worship, but I do have this verse, all right? And, and here's what I'm saying. Expressive worship, raising your hands, shouts of praise, clapping, man, tambourines are biblical, Okay, they are biblical. If you have been saved by a glorious Christ, it is appropriate for you to worship him expressively. And I could go through the Psalms and I could give you proof text after proof text after verse after verse of all the ways that God's people are called to give him shouts of praise, to clap your hands, to use instruments, to give him glory. Right, but so many people don't. So many people don't. And a lot of people say like, well, Josh, I'm not expressive like you are. The truth is, I didn't used to be expressive in worship. I was a total like hands in my pockets kind of guy. And then I just started to study what the Bible says about it, and I got convicted, and I changed. Right? You don't have to be expressive like I am, but you do need to be expressive. And here's the thing. Where you end up in this has a lot to do with where you start in this, okay? Uh, so there's a comedian, Tim Hawkins, who has this great bit. He talks about um, different ways you express yourself in worship based on what kind of church you grew up in. He's like, so if you grew up in a Presbyterian church, you've got the chicken wings in worship right here. Like this, you're holding your hymnal, you're not going anywhere, right? They're just locked in at 90 degrees. He said, if you grew up in like a a little bit more of like an expressive Baptist church or like a non-denominational church, um, you might like hold the TV in worship. You know, like you got this going on. Uh, He said, if you you grew up in like a Pentecostal charismatic church, you're washing heaven's windows, right? 
That's what we're doing here. Um, he said the ultimate goal, though, in any expressive church is when you can get to the point where you can go goalposts, heartburn, goalposts in the same song. Okay, so that's our goal here at Center Church. Goalposts, heartburn, goalposts, baby. Here's, here's the thing. You don't need to be expressive like I am. You do need to be expressive in worship. And anytime somebody says to me, well, Josh, I'm just not an expressive person, I say, I respectfully disagree with you. Everyone is expressive about what they care about. You might not be expressive in worship songs, but you're expressive when a 21-year-old catches a touchdown pass. Yeah, you're expressive about that new book that you just finished that you want to tell everybody about. You're expressive about that, that new restaurant that you just went to. You're expressive when your kid hits a single in T-ball, right? Like, you, we are expressive. That is part of being human. You're not expressive like I am. I'm not expressive like you are. But we need to stop giving ourselves the excuse of like, I'm just not an expressive person, even though you're expressive every other day of the week in every other environment. The Lord is worthy of expressive worship. And that's what I want for our church. Not that everybody needs to look the same, but that everyone would be giving God the glory that he deserves. Okay? Every saved person singing every song every Sunday expressively. All right? That's the summary of this sermon so far. All right, verse 21. And let me just say real quick. Sometimes I know people say like, I don't feel reverent when I worship expressively. I'm trying to be reverent. I really understand that. Here's what I'd say. There is nothing more reverent than doing what God says to do, right? So like read the Bible and when it's like, oh, I'm supposed to worship expressively, that's being reverent. It would actually be irreverent to not do it if God told you to do it, okay? I totally get that, especially if you grew up in a tradition that was, is kind of more subdued, but that's just what the scriptures would say. All right, verse 21. And Miriam sang to them, sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. So Miriam said to the women, sing to the Lord. Well, why should we sing to the Lord? Answer, for he has triumphed gloriously. He has thrown your enemies into the sea. He has saved you. So the fourth thing that we learn, we should sing in response to our salvation. We should sing in response to our salvation. When Moses and Miriam both called the people to sing, they gave the same reason why. Because he has triumphed gloriously. He has thrown your enemies into the sea. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh has saved you. He has defeated your enemies, so sing to him. Friends, that's the same motivation for Christian worship today. We don't sing because we feel like it. We don't sing because we like the song or because we have a nice voice. We sing because God has triumphed over our enemies. We sing because God has saved us. He has triumphed over your enemies of Satan, sin, and death. Gloriously. When did he do that? At the cross. Listen to Colossians chapter 2, verse 13 through 15. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh... God made alive together with him, being Christ, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame, here's the word, by triumphing over them in him. We were spiritually dead and headed for an eternity of spiritual death. What did God do? He made us alive together with Christ. We were covered in sin and trespasses. What did God do? He forgave us our trespasses and he canceled our debt. We were under the dominion and the harassment of Satan. What did God do? He disarmed Satan and he put him to open shame. How did God do that? How did God do that? By coming to earth as Jesus Christ, by taking your record of debt and nailing it to his cross. Jesus Christ has triumphed gloriously over your enemies, but he didn't do it by casting them into the sea. He did it by being cast into the sea for you. He did it by being cast into the sea of God's wrath so that you never have to be. He did it by taking your record of debt and nailing it onto his cross and then declaring it has finished, the debt has been paid, it can no longer be collected. In his life, death, and resurrection, Jesus Christ has triumphed gloriously over your greatest enemies. And in response, we worship the Lord. In response, we give him praise. We praise his glorious name. We praise his faithfulness. And we sing like we've been saved from something. That's what they did in Exodus 15. And that's what what we're called to do today. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you have triumphed gloriously. That when we were helpless, you came and saved us. And that now as a people, we have the privilege of responding in worship and in praise and thanksgiving. I pray that you'd help all of us to connect our salvation with our worship. God, I pray for us as a church that we'd be a place that gives you praise and glory and honor that delights to do so. And that, Lord, that would truly cause others to say the Lord is among this people. 
and that we would see people come to faith through our singing. So God, be glorified as we worship you the rest of this evening. Be glorified as we build a culture of worship in this church. We pray this in Christ's name. Stand together and sing.